So thank you, Luke. Thank you for inviting me. And um, thank you for having me here. Uh, very exciting to be here. As Luke said, uh, he's kind of stole my thunder. I have two twin girls, two months old, in the back row over there. Not only is the first time I uh, get out of the house for, or out of Montreal for a little while, but it's also the first time that they listen to Daddy talk on, on, on stage. So it's a very exciting day for me. Um, so thank you very much for having it. It's, it's, um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the exploration of the creative process for narrative VR, narrative storytelling in VR. And it's always a little bit hard, and because of the twins, I'm actually going to be reading my notes. Normally, I'm talking all around the stage, but this presentation was prepared with four hours of sleep. So um, it's always hard to make a presentation about something you have to experience to understand. And eventually, we might all end up in a conference like this, but um, virtually from wherever we are. And my role as a narrator would just be the one of weaving the narrative through the various presentations of the various places you would be in. Um, yet, everybody would be experiences those places in a slightly different way with your own agency and not only interpreting my words with the context of your previous experiences, but also applying the filter of your attention of what parts of the story to focus on. This is not very different from what happens when you read a book when you watch a movie, but the languages that have developed in those media have been crafted to the strengths of the individual medium. And I think that one of the most important things that we can do in narrative storytelling and virtual reality is understanding what the strengths of the medium are and playing to those. I think that the panel was uh, very elaborate on those points and, and um, touched them very well. The thoughtful insight in the case of a book where the abstract thought is king um, and the word that you create is a solipsistic reality in which everything only exists as a product of your thought. Nothing exists except in the shape that you give it. And so the case of cinema and the wide progeny that cinema had, the editorial control has been the means of timing the story and the focus on, of, uh, to, to bring along the focus of narration. And that has been tightly held by the, by the director. That, grips, that grip has been proving very, very hard to let go of. And much in the case of the stories around a campfire, which arguably is one of the things that, uh, one of the essential elements that made us human, the narrator drives the timing of the delivery and the focus of your attention. And I think that VR is somewhat breaking the fourth wall, but in the opposite direction. Rather than having the story come out to you, it allows you to come into the story. And it takes you there and connects you much more viscerally than any other medium that I know of, with the experience and in a way that no other media can. So at the same time, all of the rules for storytelling have yet to be written for in the VR context. And the process to me has been one of unlearning. Um, I've, I've been in um, storytelling for about the 25 years of my, of my career, and you kind of get yourself set into ways, into the same, you, you learn by experience and that experience builds into wisdom and that wisdom is what you apply every day. You find a problem, you don't rethink all the parameters of that same problem every day, you just fall into a solution. And the exciting thing about VR is that that solution might be a different one and you have to really think, deconstruct, unlearn and reapply some or the core elements of the wisdom that are, that are, that are still there, or still relevant. Um, and this is personally one of the things that drove me to VR, and in particular VR storytelling. Um, my first, uh, paradoxically, my first job in the industry was doing VR. Um, I was trying to get into visual effects for uh, advertising, which was, um, I was in Italy, in Milan at the time, and advertising was really the only thing that was going on. There wasn't a lot of cinema that was in Rome. Um, and getting into visual effects was really hard, but I knew CG and I was obviously playing with technology. And so 
VR was this new thing, and I, I had some experience about stereo for other reasons, and so uh, they just put me in a dark room with another guy and um, said, just do this architectural project. We'll, we'll, we'll figure out what to do <laughs> with, with you later. Um, and so um, later on, in about the year 2000, I built a, v a studio that had VR in its name and had, was a research facility as well as a production studio that was uh, meant to explore um, virtual reality, not only as storytelling, but it all, in, in all of the aspects and uh, impacts it could have on society. Probably about 15 years too early. Um, but the, um, this is the, the thing that is fascinating to me is I'm a technologist, mostly because I don't consider myself high on the artistic rate. I, when I was doing, when I was an artist, a 3D artist, I was looking at the guy next to me and seeing, hmm, what, how come yours looks much better than mine? And they would all come to me with their technical problems. So um, I took the hint and took the, the path that was easier. Uh, but I've always kept thinking of tools and technology in, to me, their means to a purpose, and the purpose for me is storytelling. And the undoing of the synaptic pathways um, to, to create new ones that better fit the medium is, is, in order to tell better stories, is fascinating to me. So this is a lot of why there is a lot of excitement in, in, uh, in VR at this point in time, because it's a medium that connects you with things and lets you experience things in a much deeper way than any other one before it. And if you think at the reach that audiovisual technologies have had in 100 years, it's hard not to project what the impact VR will have. Um, the the purpose that I was mentioning earlier, that the VR can be a tool to the purpose, to me, is human connections. And when you can connect viscerally to something as deep as you can with VR, and Jeremy was saying it this morning, I've shown, I have a picture of my girls with VR headsets, but it was obviously turned off. <laughs> um, but I've shown to kids as, as young as four, and the sense of amazement and the uh, sense of wonder that VR elicits is, is unique, in my opinion. Uh, my wife was never interested in the fact that I worked on Avatar or Tintin or Planet of the Apes or etc. But as soon as she tried VR, said, I have to show this to my, my grandmother, which is absolutely um, stunning. And much in the same way, when we started filming the Nomads project in Amboseli in Kenya, uh, we wanted to share with all of the villagers in the village what virtual reality was. And this, we wanted them to have a clear sense of what we were trying to accomplish. And um, on the day we were shooting, the entire village, one by one, lined up, and children, adults, elders, experience a prior experience that we had shot, which was the herders part of the Nomad series as well, that had been filmed in Mongolia and finished a couple of months earlier. So all of them um, saw the experience, and it didn't feel strange to them. To many of them, it was the first time um, that, that uh, they saw dig anything digital, any, any video, any high-definition video. Um, and many people had never traveled outside of the Amboseli region and had had very little contact, if at all, with anything, uh, with any technology. They took their first trip abroad through virtual reality. And they seemed to live this as something that was naturally aligned with their human senses and how they were used to, or they are used to, experience reality. Um, at the end of the day, they spent hours talking about the animals, the people, the landscapes, with the same level of passion and excitement and the same words as if they had been real life experiences. They quickly accepted the VR camera as if it was a local visitor in the village and made it one of them. And that really translates in when you experience the whole piece. And I'm going to play you a clip from that piece. <laughs>
As I said at the beginning, very hard to show something that is not meant for this medium, for a, a square. And from my perspective, it was a little bit washed out. But if you haven't seen it, it's, uh, it's on the Oculus Store. You can go on your Gear VR. It's, uh, it's out there. And I um, obviously, <laughs> I recommend that you go, you go and see it. But it's a good, good experience. But um, the, the sense of presence that is given by the fact that the camera is accepted or that it's part of an experience is one of the most precious and delicate, delicate, delicate unique elements of VR. And the preservation of that suspension of disbelief that allows you to be transported has to be protected almost at all costs. Um, this is why, and there was an interesting part of the discussion of the panel earlier, I consider 360-degree video and VR as two different media. Um, games and VR is obviously two different media. The fact that they share a device don't mean that they, have, they obey by the same rules. You all have a television set at home, you watch news on it, you probably stream radio by now, you, uh, show, you see shows on Netflix, you do television series, you do uh, TV, you probably do Skype with your family if, you live, if they live somewhere else on the planet. You play video games on that same TV set, the fact that they share a dev delivery device doesn't mean that it's the same medium. Um, and just to go back to how we cultivated or we got to, the, to preserving that sense of presence, the first project, the first cinematic VR project that the studio made was um, called Strangers. It's a one-on-one -on -one intimate moment between the viewer and Patrick Watson, which, who's a very talented musician uh, from Montreal, as he writes music for his new album. And it was shot on a winter day in Montreal, and we didn't want this to be a performance or a music video. So it's a moment in life that you're actually sharing with the artist. And these are the kind of things that you wouldn't want to do in another medium. You, you want VR to be this shared moment. Um, and as our first real foray into VR, we had a strong intuition, this is um, as a studio, that the, the Musician working would be the powerful subject. And in a dialogue with the musician, we, we actually placed the camera in a, few, in a few places. And at some point, it was very clear that we needed to direct and say, this is where, where would a friend sit when they came along and, and just spent time with you? Um, and so we wanted to, the, to have the viewer be and have an experience, a human connection, um, while simply being within the experience, without being distracted by the expectation that something must happen beyond what is directly experienced. Um, this, I'm going to just play a small clip.
So to protect that sense of presence, we really um, envisioned the camera in a very anthropomorphic way. Um, so we needed to feel that it was a person, and that we, we instructed Patrick Watson to, to specifically think of that person as a friend. Um, and that defined the way the camera was positioned in the scene and what the experience eventually became, and, and how the artist would relate to the, to, to the camera and the friend in that um, same, same um, connection, which is always bi-directional. So we always try to think of our VR experiences in, from such relational perspective. Uh, the viewer is a part of the story, and the experiences we create are as much about the viewer as they are about the characters of the story. We try to nurture a direct emotional connection between the viewer and the subject and to make that relation evolve through the experience. If you look around, you will always find justifications on why you are there and why what is happening is happening around you. We do not conceive of cinematic VR as a viewer who just sees through a 360 degree camera. We feel that it would be reducing and it would be disconcerting if you just look around and see yourself as a ghost. There's no justification for you being there because the, the main sense of VR is that you are there. You as a person are a part of that scene and that needs to be respected. The viewer is a meaningful part of the experience and an integral part of the story's dramatic arc. And that makes it obviously uh, an order of magnitude more complicated, but is essential to respect it for the story to be integral and for that sense of feeling to be preserved. So Jurassic World was a, a companion experience that Universal asked us to do for the movie release. And um, we tried to shoot it and to work uh, with a trained dinosaur, but she was like, behaving very erratically and uncooperatively that day. And so we ended up calling on Industrial Light and Magic to Thank you for laughing. You were the sole one to get my job. <laughs> um, to make a CG version, and I'm going to play a small clip from that one as well. So our intent here was to explore if the viewers, thank you. 
um, if the viewer's sense of presence and direct relationship with the character could still be effective and impactful with a totally fictional being. Um, and if you look around, our focus on to why the viewer is in the story is everywhere. Uh, obviously, again, you, you can't look around in a, in a flat rectangular screen. But we conceived of the viewer as a park ranger who's in, a, who's in his coffee break and um, um, in the Apatosaurus habitat and ha has developed a reciprocal familiarity with the creature. And you can see the coffee thermos and the, um, the radio and the torchlight, etc. Um, and defining the role of the viewer on the outset um, helps us design how we design the set how we design your, your presence as a viewer in the, in the environment. Um, and the behavior of the, of the animal gets impacted or gets influenced by this as well. And it's important to turn the technology limitations as a tool, um, or at, at least as creative parameters. If the dinosaur, and the story was developed with this in mind, if the dinosaur had been threatening to you, um, it would, you would be compelled to run away. And you wouldn't be able to do it, obviously, because you are, <laughs> the camera is fixed in a position in space, and you would likely experience a sense of disconnect. You would not be able to feel like you are part of that, because even if you startle, um, you would not see the world react to you as, as you would be if you were there. Um, so your sense of presence in that moment would break, and the piece would lose a lot of its interest. So we wanted to creatively explore the notion of a static position and make that a thoughtful component of the story. There is a, the more you are prompted for agency, the more you are prompted for action, the, the, the more disconnected you become to the story. I, I had a, there was a, um, an experience that made me a, a slightly politically, uh, ter politically incorrect term I coined. I called it the Hawkins effect because you have this brain that is telling you to do all these things and you are completely constrained. You cannot move. Your, your only way of communicating is through very reduced uh, communication means. And so it's, it's, um, that makes a disconnect between you and the story, which is exactly the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. Um, the next project I wanted to talk about, um, and, and, and one of the things that you might notice in, throughout all of these things is, obviously I'm respecting the pieces by not talking over them, but also the timing of the pieces and the editorial is such that it allows you to fall into the story. There's no rush. They're, they're always paced in a way, and, and if you find that editorial is jarring, in many cases is because the editorial is again an unlearning we have to do from the conventions of editorial that we are that we have from uh, past lives. Um, we are deeply convinced, I think, from the beginning, everybody at the studio, that um, cinematic VR is not 360 cinema. It's it's its own medium, requires a, com a completely different creative mindset and an approach, and there's no point in holding on to the concept that is perfectly valid in other media to controlling the viewer's attention. In effect, when we find clarity about what the meaning of the viewer is in the context of the piece, and the relationship between the viewer and the subject is carved out and orchestrated, brings the viewers onto a state of being rather than one of spectatorship. And that's exactly the type of um, thing that, that we want to achieve, because it doesn't matter as much where, at that point, where they're looking and the experience. It's something that they lived and they remember. And there might be repeated viewing. If you think, I was making an example earlier in a conversation, if you think about a book or a movie that you've seen recently, the plot elements that you actually have to absolutely catch 100% in order to follow the story are very few and far between. Um, there is a, a website that I think reduces all of the classics of literature to a tweet. So if you can express something in 140 characters, there's very high likelihood that you will be able to, to drive the audience's attention to those key points, but then allow them to experience the rest. And that will be a much more visceral connection with the story. They will have a much bigger memory and a much deeper connection with that story than if they had caught everything you wanted to show them.
Curious, thank you. I can 100% guarantee you that you will miss parts of the action because everything is happening in, around you in 360 degrees. You only have 110 in the best case scenario degrees field of view in front of you. So you will miss at least two thirds of the action. And this was not a piece that we conceived as a so it ha there is a story weaved, obviously, it's, it's also the story that is weaved throughout the, um, the Curious show from Cirque du Soleil, but it was very carefully choreographed specifically as a virtual reality experience. It was a collaboration with Cirque du Soleil Media, um, and we very much created with the artistic direction, uh, Michel Laprise, that, that was um, um, created specifically for this medium. Um, and I think I heard somebody gasp when the llama came so close to the camera. Um, I, I, I wasn't going to go into the details of the camera, but we, we have a, a, the camera is, and, I'm, and I won't go because we still maintain it with a certain, uh, close, close to our chests. Um, but our camera is inspired by principles that are very, very natural. And so you guys are experts in the field. The literature is out there, which, which are the right things to do um, with a camera, and which are the things that you really shouldn't be doing with the camera. And um, so it is still very comfortable. I, again, I invite you to go see it in, in your Gear VR. Uh, Curious is out there. And, and see how comfortable that proximity is and how it doesn't take you out, but rather brings you in because th that performance is made for you. And, in Curious, you are part of the cabinet of curiosities, and you are being welcomed as a part of the, of the team. Um, and by the way, this is one case in which sound, all of our experiences are very, very carefully crafted in terms of spatialization of the sound, even on the Gear VR, as I was discussing earlier, um, following up on the question. And that is, um, audio is spatial, at all times, and it drives your attention, or it can call to one or another point, but it's never pulling you from, we, we, we do it somewhat discreetly. Again, to preserve that state of being, uh, rather than being a spectator. Um, taking the idea of presence further, um, we, believe that VR can also lead uh, to an experience of shared consciousness between the viewer and the characters to which the word of the story is revealed. Um, the Wild Experience was one of the first, probably the first VR uh, companion piece that we released and we produced with Fox, Searchlight. Um, we wanted to, the viewer to feel like they were becoming one of the protagonists of the story um, that was played by Reese Witherspoon and Laura Dern. Uh, the camera positioning was made so that places the viewer in the middle of the eyeline of the actress um, during a very highly 
intimate moment. And the viewer gets to experience both of the character subjectivities. And although you are in the middle of an interaction, there is a sense of dreaminess that is created also by a voiceover, which again, the rest of the audio in the experience is spatialized. This uh, audio is mixed so that it makes you feel that the voice emanates from inside your head. It's a voiceover that puts you in a dreamlike state um, and, and makes you believe this story or this appearance of, of a ghost somehow. If you've seen the movie, you know that the mother is no longer alive. And, and we also had um, integrated the, the something that we call reactivity. is an interactive um, component to the story that is not, however, um, rational or, or an explained interactivity. You don't have to press any buttons, you don't have to look into any areas. But depending on where are you looking at, at a certain point in time, things might or might not happen. And you will never see a transition. It's always protecting the, the experience as it is. But things might happen differently and the story might have different um, outcomes. So it's, we, we call that, it's, it's a responsive behavior of the, of the piece, but we call that reactivity rather than interactivity. And when we, we feel that when properly used in the context of the story, the reactivity can really enhance the sense of presence and how you feel about the, the uh, actors. So let me play a clip from that. Every day there's a sunrise and a sunset. And you can choose to be there for it. You can put yourself in the way of beauty. And that, by the way, was the, that part of the audio was not the voiceover I was referring to. That is actually spatialized, and it draws your attention to uh, where Laura Dern is. Um, and I was mentioning earlier uh, the Nomad series. I, I lost. I don't know exactly, look how much time I still have because I have the I lost track of the timer here. But I, I'll continue going until you wave at me saying, "Kill it." Um, so we. I was mentioning Maasai being part of the Nomad series, so we just released, you can go on Oculus and the Oculus Store and download it uh, on your Gear VR and soon to come on the other platforms. Um, it's a three-part series for the moment, but we plan to release new episodes in the future. And we wanted to explore the reality of nomadic groups across, across the planet. Uh, the Maasai was one, Herders, which we showed to the Maasai, um, was another one. And the third one is Sea Gypsies, and it was filmed in Borneo in a community of Bajau Laut. Uh, largely, it's a community of stateless people that have been kind of pushed around and live um, as nomads in the sea and have been doing so for centuries. And it's a, this is a rarefying way of life, and we wanted to have the experiential power of VR storytelling uh, to have people feel and connect to, to the human reality of living like that and of, of this um, type of lives. Um, the project presented a number of technology challenges as well, like filming underwater or in a very remote location, exposed and in close proximity to seawater. Our camera is a very well-engineered camera. Uh, it's not a rig of GoPros, uh, rather it's custom electronics and custom um, uh, mechanical engineering. G gives us great quality footage, there's a lot of flexibility in the design, uh, but this one really pushes to the edge. Let's say that um, not every imaging element survived the experience. <laughs>
somebody earlier mentioned movement. This was not our first experience of um, uh, moving the camera. I think that the project with LeBron James claimed that uh, title. But um, certainly, again, if done in a respectful way, considering the position of the viewer, the camera can be moved, and it's a very effective uh, storytelling tool. Um, and in, in expanding the boundaries of the exploration, um, we, we try to go and, and explore again, try many things and see, see which ones work. We, we by now have a very good feeling, but by no means we, we consider that the exploration is done. We've we barely scratched the surface, not only in describing the language, but the language by definition is something that has a sender and a, re and a receiver, and, and it's, um, it's always mutual and bidirectional, and it, you exchange roles in the process. And so it has, to, a, to an extent, is an exploration, to another one is a convention. And so we need to find out what works with people to expand on that. And presence in virtual reality, as much as we want to protect it, is still an illusion. It's a powerful illusion, it's, but, but it's, again, very fragile, easy to break. Um, if we lose presence, the, whatever ideas or emotions we wanted to convey will, will feel less engaging and far. Um, and on the other hand, when we nurture it, the, the, it, it is expanded through the experience. Um, it, and it, it acts as an emotional amplifier. Whether the intention is to elicit wonder, empathy, loneliness, presence is the, that foundation. And generally, messing with time or the progression of time is considered counter to the, to the sense of presence. So in this case, we explored slow motion. And um, um, I'll let you see what you think, if it works or not. I've actually, um, this is only a 90-second teaser that was released for a Mobile World Conference of a piece that, a longer piece that will be uh, produced with Cirque du Soleil. But um, this is all. Thank you. Uh, so that was um, uh, not only obviously a technology challenge, but a creative challenge. And I think that the main philosophy at the studio is to try to continue to evolve those in lockstep. Um, to a certain extent, we do technology. We, we do technology development only because there isn't anything better out there than what we could develop ourselves. But it also allows us to inform the creative process, and then the creative process challenges the technology, and the technology informs and, and uh, um, feeds creative input to the creative process itself. So we kind of try to advance in lockstep with, with both. What we can do prompts new ideas of what we could do, and what we are doing poses challenges to the technology, and we try to advance it. Um, this is the time in which I was going to modulate my time, so I have the question to please, but I also have a couple of more experiences if you guys want to hear more and there are no questions. More? Okay. So, so um, LeBron James was probably one of the most challenging pro um, uh, projects that we've undertaken. And one where, 
Believe it or not, the, 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 despite what would seem like a fairly trivial subject, uh, is one where we probably push the barriers of storytelling further. Um, and many of our earlier projects were a single shot or very few shots. Uh, LeBron James contains more than 30 shots. And to be able to edit and move forward through the narrative without breaking the viewer's state of presence, uh, we really structured the uh, journey, the piece as an interior journey uh, of sorts, where LeBron intimate and self-reflective voiceover gives the viewer the perspective and the impression of being inside his mind um, and his flow of thoughts. And so we coined the phrase of having, um, uh, and obviously I, my brain is blanking at the moment, but direct immersion versus uh, mediated or, or driven immersion. And so in some cases, you're, although you're not told where to look, you're told what to think of what the, the abstraction or the, the thought process is of what is happening around you. Um, and so inside the mind of LeBron, we were bridging each of the individual moments of the narrative. And so there is much more of a weave and a, and a dramatic arc in this. Um, the mind is, in this sense, is a much more flexible vehicle than the, than the physical reality. And it can transport us fluidly between memories and, and a state of lucid dreaming um, uh, or past uh, memories, fantasies, and reveries. Um, and if we immerse the viewer into the character's consciousness, uh, imagination, memories, then we can use the vehicle of the character's mind as a storytelling device and becomes much easier to travel from one place to another and to move forward without losing the sense of presence. Uh, basketball, a big part of our family. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Absolutely. My boys love basketball. My wife loves coming to the games. Father-in-law, my mother, my mother-in-law, all my family, man. They, we are, we are basketball. You know, to have fun at what you do and to love what you do is the ultimate. That's what it's all about, man. Every time I step out on the floor, you know, I love the game because it's giving so much to me and I have fun with it too. So, you know, if you're able to find that balance, uh, you, the game is going to treat you the right way. Obviously, to be crowned, uh, you know, the champion at the end of the season is everyone's goal and that's a lot of people's goal. And some people get it, some people don't. But I've always prepared for it and uh, I want to try to put myself in a position where I can uh, be number one at the end of the year. I think the one thing that I tell rookie LeBron James, you know, me going into my 13th year is uh, patience. You know, nothing happens overnight. You know, it's all the hard work and the dedication that you need to put into it every single day that will get you to where you want to become and where you want to be. Um, you have to be very patient with the game. When you're patient with the game, the game gets back to you. I feel great about next season. Um, I think this is, uh, this is a time to be excited. If you're not excited about the game of basketball, then you're in the wrong business. If you're not excited about competition, you're in the wrong business. If you're not excited about the pitfalls and everything that comes with the process, then you're in the wrong business. And, um, you know, I'm ready for the marathon. That's what it's all about. So in this case, they, um, as I was mentioning earlier, the audio is a huge component and not only as a, as a spatialization to, to enhance the sense of presence, and it's, a, and it's an incredible uh, vehicle for enhancing and protecting that sense of presence, but also as a narrative device um, in order to have uh, the narration and the bridging of the editorial components. Uh, we have a, somebody earlier mentioned have the importance of having um, audio designers. Uh, we actually have a separate company that we started because we saw that there was a need in the industry to have uh, quality design for audio for th cinematic um, experiences in VR. And um, Headspace Studios is a, is a fully owned subsidiary that not only work on our projects, but they, they work on their own um, as well. And they, they have a very, very uh, careful treatment of the audio just to be able to um, protect and immerse and enhance uh, that, that the viewer in the story. 
And I see that there are questions already getting ready, so I'm going to just have this slide up and take your questions. Can you, can you speak to interactive storytelling in, in a world of uh, um, clickable links, photos, videos, other we'll kinds have to of media check. Well, that this, we know of or don't know of that's is, coming too far. Uh, within the, within the uh, spherical video story? So, um, not as a studio, meaning that um, we have really chosen to... So, the, the interactivity and the, the explorations, I think, are uh, perfectly fine. Again, if you protect the sense of, of immersion. So, if you, are, uh, if you are too focused on to your interaction, you will... And, and if the interaction is not done in a way that preserves the, 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 the role that you have inside the story, that limits your ability, that, that feels, feels constricted, it will take you out of the story. And our main goal is to actually preserve your suspension of disbelief, and not only of disbelief, but your sense of immersion, your being there, the fact that you're living a story rather than playing a game. And so we, we are currently working on something that will have a little bit more interactivity, but we are careful in doing so, again, basing on the core principles that we've established in the storytelling. Um, there's plenty of other, uh, I would call them different media, and I, I, I am perfectly cognizant that media can blur and mix, but I, I would think that the more agency you have, the more you're veering towards a different, a different type of medium. Thank you. How much of the LeBron piece was scripted, and how, of it, how much of it was improvised? Um, the, there was a fair amount that was scripted, meaning that it was, we were planning what the uh, setups would be. Uh, we spent about four weeks with him uh, over multiple trips to Miami where he was training for the preseason. Um, but there was obviously a, a part of it which was his narration and, and his, um, the, the how things were um, happening and what, where we would film, etc. obviously was scripted. But uh, there was his contribution, obviously, as so well. So those were his words? Yes, absolutely. And then oh, my last question is, what is the ultimate potential of virtual reality and what might it be able to enable? Wow. <laughs> what a question. Um, like, it's 1896 and the Lumiere brothers are traveling Europe and you're asking me to predict the iPhone. <laughs> um, well, honestly, I think that the... Um, he, here's the thing, I'm, I'm a technologist and I love technology and I, I consider it fun and I'm a geek and I do as much as I can with, with the time I have. But the, the thing is... Technology is only here because it burns something or, or it turns something on in here or in here or both, uh, ideally. And I think that the, everything we've done is really from painting on cave walls and telling stories around a campfire, etc. It's about human connection and it's about how we want to express ourselves. And this is not better but certainly a less mediated medium to anyone we've had before. And it's completely rudimentary. It's less rudimentary than the first paid job I ever had, which we had a $1 million machine sitting there that was producing a lot of heat and huge cables and a very heavy helmet. But it's still in its infancy. And that is what is exciting. That there's so much potential that nobody uh, can imagine. And if somebody can, certainly not me. But um, whoever tells you they know what is going to happen in VR is lying to you. Second One more question. question. One uh, last question. Which is your favorite VR camera for cinematic VR? Our own camera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we've, we've developed it specifically for this purpose. So it shoots stereo in a very natural way. It shoots 360, it shoots high frame rate. Um, we, if, if there was another one that was better out there, we would use it. 
Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you, Sebastian. Thank you very much. You can go back and take care of your twins. <laughs>